Good morning from Alcorobi. It's a lovely breezy morning, dry. We're lacking water and we're lacking rain. And this is what sunny Catalana looks like. But I've chosen plants using my permaculture skills to survive in such environments. And I freely use uh, resources that nature provides for me and I call it providence. It's a form of spiritual justice. And my work rate is quite slow because of it. Um, when resources make themselves available, I, I use them. And so my timetable is very ephemeral. But here you can see there's a selection of plants which either have some sort of drought resistance or, or some sort of aesthetic appeal. And those that don't, um, well, they require my constant attention. So. We're going to come to this point about water and irrigation and fertility when you see the the, uh, the system temple which I'm building, which is going to hold 120,000 litres of water. But before I get there, I'm going, to, I'm going to take you on a quick fire tour. So remember, you can find me at an umbrella organisation of projects I've been working on for many years now called SotoriologicGarden.com. OK, so there we have a typical, beautiful Tradescantia purpurea and jade plants and various herb plants which can and geraniums which can actually man, maintain themselves in such arid dry conditions and especially a raised bed and if you build raised beds there can be fertility points but at the same time they can dry out very quickly because they heat up much quicker so as you can see the whole place is concreted and that's because it collects rainwater and then the rainwater is stored in various tanks here which are has a solar panel and a couple and a few batteries to actually run the irrigation. Now, at this time of the year, because I'm here, I have to hand water twice a day, and that's a lot of water. So let's have a look. It's tomatoes, cow, which has drought resistance, cabbage, which I feed. Now, this, I mean, it's still edible, this cabbage, but I actually um, grow it for the chickens. Um, chickens love cabbage. And some citrus plants there, trees that uh, once established like vines as well, um, are, are there forever, basically. And, and that's the thing. There are pockets of water underneath the ground in the geology. Here's a vine, for instance, which has been there for two years, and it's not going to produce any fruit this year. But that's fine. I'm just going to keep it alive, and next year it should do something. And this was a nectary in which looked very comfortable in that corner now, and it gave me a, a handful of fruit this year. Next year, that will probably go up by fivefold. So let's leave the structure and go over to some of the other fertile points in the land and here in front of us we have the carob tree now carobs have gone up in value so they've become a primary crop instead of a tertiary crop and that's the name of this project Alcorobi and just look at the carob so you see them increasingly more in health food shops because they're high in calcium and phosphor they've got very good antioxidant properties and various other medicinal uses but they're mainly industrial, using glues and cosmetics and that type of thing. Here we have uh, cypress trees which grow freely in these types of environments. Again, just one year to get them established. And, uh, and then you can forget about them to a certain extent. But they, they are prone, uh, uh, young plants are prone to other animals um, interfering and killing them off. Especially stray dogs and uh, wild boar and that type of thing which pass through here. Uh, Mary Louisa, which is very high in citronella. So that's a tree when it gets going. And other. Carobs are really important. If you haven't got carobs on your land, it's a pity really. Um, but they do condition the soil underneath them. You can see there's a lot of diversity under a carob tree. Look at that. You know, there's wild asparagus under there. I've seen parsley growing under there. But there's a lot of diversity under there because the leaf litter and the fruit litter actually decompose onto the soil. So here we are, pomegranate. So I'm going to have a few more pomegranates this year. Last year I had my first pomegranate. So that plant has taken about three years, four years to establish. Very slow conditions. I don't want a tree, I want a, I want a bush. That's the only way I'm going to grow a lot of plants here because one, they add wind breaks, but two, they're likely to, to create their own shady conditions for their own survival. Um, whereas trees, when they completely expose their trunks, like here, for instance, are, um, actually absorb a lot of heat and it can deform the tree. Yeah? 
So bushes are probably the way forward. And if you look at what a, an olive tree is, it's in fact a, a bush. It's an olive bush. It's ol, ol, olive bush is where you get the word Olympus from. So in very hot environments, they cast shade upon their own trunks to, to actually um, prevent overheating within the trunks and the, um, the vessels, that, the phloem and xylem vessels, which, which carry uh, the sugars and the water up and down the trunk. So here we are. This is the fertility point of the land. So I'm going to make it very quick because I've done videos on this before. It's going to be in the shape of an egg. I'm excavating an oval point and using all the material to infill what I've been actually creating here. And this is an aperture between two dry stone walls. And that's what I'm vol uh, asking volunteers to come and do now. Help me fill in the aperture on this dry stone wall with a, a mix of concrete which is coming into from a lorry, hopefully. Now, Resources make themselves available, so I've had some sponsors, but I also had an accident a couple of years ago, so I was knocked over by two vans, and they made it very difficult for me to get some sort of uh, justice. So in the end, I went to a solicitor's, and it was a no, no, no win, no fee basis, because I haven't got any money. And um, basically, now the insurance companies have admitted liability, but the drivers made it very, very difficult. They wouldn't give me any information at the time. So... That's a textbook standard payout, which all monies will go, will be reinvested back into the farm. I'm creating fertility on a farm using resources which make themselves freely available, including um, uh, concrete, concrete blo blocks and structures, which have been left over from previous uh, pro projects or abandoned. It's amazing what I found in the dry riverbed, for instance. Um, bees here, which once you start uh, getting on top of, will uh, diversify and provide you free swarms and that type of thing. So providence is, it, for me, is spiritual justice. It's the way we integrate with the land and bring in um, free resources. And we, we change our timetable ephemerally to, to deal with, the, with uh, nature's whims, if you want to call it that. So that's what I'm promoting. And... What you want to see here in the future and try and visualize is a platform over the top. What underneath it with maybe fish and, and other plants. And volunteers practicing yoga or meditating or doing something of the sort. And that's the idea of creating mind-body balance. It's uh, create a structure where you have a vision in the future of integration between ecology and spirit. Okay guys, read that message and get back to me if you want to volunteer.